it's always a question you know, of definition. Um, I, I think that there's a tension going on there, and the way I nowadays look at it is the tension between, if you like, the structural factor, that is, the, the framework of international politics, if you like, geopolitics, uh, and uh, at the same time on the other side, the tension between systemic issues, that is, the nature of the regime, the quality of social and political relationships within the system. So, uh, in t so externally, it's really tough, clearly, with sanctions regime and with everything else going on. But uh, at the structural level, we've got a breakdown going on. Obviously, Russia is uh, not isolated, its economy is not in tatters, but nevertheless, it's tough times indeed. Yes, they're declining economic performance, um, relative isolation, and certainly uh, a consolidation of the Atlantic Alliance against Russia now. <laughs> I mean, Russia will be fine. I mean, in economic. I, I, I think that um, at the moment, obviously, things could get worse. But uh, in terms of purely economic management, the in Russia's economic indicator is obviously declining growth and stagnation and so on. But in purely financial reserves and budget uh, surplus, even now, uh, the, uh, and all those other factors, uh, no, I mean, oil will go up. I mean, at the moment, we're really talking about uh, Saudi Arabia preparing to raise, uh, to reduce supply, and so on. So, it's not that, of course. The big question is, we, 2016 is a new Duma election, 2018 the presidential elections. Uh, a fourth term for Putin? Well, it's at the moment, of course, opinion polls strongly in favor. So, this third term of Putin is, in a sense, uh, a lot of chickens are coming home to roost, but none of them are being cooked, if I may put it so clearly. Um, I mean, Russia can stagger on uh, for a long time, but really, it, 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 in many ways, this stalemate in which Russia finds itself, it, it's terribly frustrating for the West, it's terribly frustrating for active internet, intellectuals and dynamic business people within Russia, but at least it provides, well, I, I couldn't say a breathing space, but ultimately, there has to be a vision for the future. and. A vision for the future is something that Putin is unable to articulate. So we do need a change of leadership or a change of Putin's orientation. I do believe that the system itself which he has built has an evolutionary capacity. Maybe they have demonstrated that, but uh, maybe with leadership. Um, but whether they see this opportunity, I don't know. Thank you very much for including me on the panel. I have a rather unusual assignment, which is to try and lay out a few of the ideas that, Rich, um, that Richard Sakla presented in his paper, and then I'll make a few comments of my own um, in response. And so, obviously, Sakwa is one of the most uh, prolific authors in our field. Probably all the books you saw in his office are the ones that he's written in the last few years, because he seems to come out with a book every year, and a, collection of articles and, you know, very well-respected academic pieces. And in fact, when I wrote my uh, PhD dissertation at UCLA, I quoted him on the first page because my dissertation was about, um, my dissertation was about um, St. Petersburg politics, and Sakwa made the important observation that uh, e even at that time in the late Soviet period that life in Russia was determined not so much in capital, Moscow, and St. Petersburg, but also in the regions around Russia. So, but, uh, so I've known him for a very long time, but I would also like to point out that uh, even though we're on very friendly terms, we pretty much completely disagree on everything. So I'm not really the best person to present his ideas, uh, but, but I'll try to be fair, I'll put it that way. So in, in this paper, Sakwa briefly sketches out some of the ideas that obviously he's been developing in, in a lot of his other works. And so he, he makes clear that in this term, uh, since Putin came back to the Kremlin in 2012, there's elements of continuity and change in, in what's going on in Putin. However, he does point out that the challenges now testing the regime are pushing it to its limits. And so according to the mythology that Putin's laid out there, the 1990s were a time of troubles, 
And then uh, under Putin's leadership, he's been able to restore state power in Russia since coming to office in 2000. And in contrast to presidents in Central Asian countries, with many, some of whom have been in office since Soviet times, Putin didn't want to have that same kind of president for life taint, so he put Medvedev in office. And Medvedev, of course, was liberal but pliant. And so, according to Sakwa's analysis, during his term, Medvedev did not really achieve much, but he, quote, set the direction of travel for Russia. And so, in, in this definition of Putinism that, that Sakwa uses, he again describes it as pliant and capacious in the sense that uh, Putinism is able to draw on all different aspects of Russian society. And so Putin can incorporate, you know, from liberal to Siloviki, all these people have, a, have an influence on his policies and, and what he's doing, but none of them can really challenge his power. And so according to Sakwa, the Medvedev years suggest that Putinism has the potential to evolve out of its own limitations and contradictions. So, so he sees, uh, as we heard in his uh, spoken comments, an ability to evolve. However, he says, once uh, the plans that Medvedev had put in place that would have allowed the state to follow the law to set up a rule of law government and to be accountable more or less ended when Putin decided to come back to power in 2011. So according to Sakwa, everyone is a winner in Putin's Russia. But the middle class or the creative class, uses different uh, terms for it, was not happy. And so unfortunately Putin does not understand their unhappiness and their lack of gratitude for what he's done for Russia. And these feelings of Putin have marked his third term. So uh, as he said, uh, this morning, Putin's return has really made life dreary for uh, the best and the brightest people in Russia. And so Sakwa presents a rather optimistic uh, portrayal of what's happening in Russia today. For example, by allowing Navalny to run for mayor <coughs> in the summer of 2013, Putin wanted to gradually decompress the political system and allow, allow more room for change. Uh, however, instead of pursuing that path, Putin basically gave up on modernization and went for Eurasian integration. And he claims that the new Eurasian Union, which would bring together Russia and several countries around it, perhaps uh, in Putin's plan Ukraine as well, would not fence itself off from the EU, but complement it. And Putin said that it would provide freedom, democracy, and market rules. So according to so is just kind of sketching out these ideas, and it says according until about 2007, Russia basically was a status quo power, but then it became a revisionist power, and sort of, rather than being a norm taker, decided to try and set the norms in the international system. But the real uh, problems with East-West relations came to a head with the ouster of Yanukovych, of course, in, in 2014, and what Sakwa calls the rise of significantly nationalist forces in Kiev. So, in, in this, interpretation, Russia restored Crimea, and in the Donbass was, quote, drawn into a conflict from which no endpoint is apparent. So now, of course, Putin is more popular than ever in Russia, uh, and if, the, if, according to Sakwa's analysis, if there is to be regime change, the polls indicate that the successor to Putin will be much more authoritarian than, than Putin is. And he's also extremely critical, Sakwa is critical of the sanctions describing them as a form of collective punishment on the Russian people and threatening to reduce a significant part of the population to punery. But uh, as we heard, he is also critical of the overall uh, structure of the, of the Russian system and the economy. And according to Sakwa, Putin is now uh, you know, developing this idea that reform is possible. Sakwa argues that Putin is moving to stimulate small business and to strengthen the rule of law and improve property rights, and claims that Russia, you know, so that's what's happening domestically, but in the external world, Russia is uh, defending the institutions of international governance. So, in conclusion, Sakwa says that Putin will avoid the mistakes of the Soviet Union, and those mistakes were delaying reform and increasing defense spending. Uh, so that's that's how Sakwa sees uh, what's happening now. 
uh, and he argues that today there are no obstacles to reform which would involve, and, and these reforms would involve more competitive elections and a more vibrant political space. Uh, so he, and so the, 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 the gist of what Sankar is saying is that the goals of the regime are sort of meeting the fundamental human needs and uh, to, to, to providing public goods for Russians. So, um, as I said, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that this, this view of Russia really has uh, much traction compared to what's actually happening in Moscow. So, unfortunately, Richard's not here to make the view himself, and, and it would be quite interesting to engage in a dialogue. But I would like to just lay out a few points and then uh, turn the floor over to, to, to colleagues who have read the other chapters in the book. So, I, I think the first point. Um, is this idea that Sokol presents that Russia under Putin is capable of reform, political reform, economic reform. It's a little vague, but he clearly means, you know, it's, it's possible that Putin could liberalize both in economic and political terms. So the problem, though, with that argument is that Putin has seemingly held power, uh, you know, full power to do whatever he wants for, for many years, almost since he came into office in the beginning. And during that time, he has not really implemented, since 2004, there haven't been any real efforts to implement reforms that would broaden the political space or to diversify the economy. In fact, Putin's done the exact opposite. And I think the problem is that he saw what, what happened to Gorbachev. Gorbachev tried to liberalize the system, and the lesson Putin, and everything fell apart from Gorbachev. And so the lesson Putin drew from that was that if you start to liberalize, things are going to fall apart. And that seems to be the same lesson the Chinese have drawn. President Xi has drawn, I'm sure Harley will get into that, so I'll leave that for you. Um, so I think the result is that, um, uh, uh, in fact, Putin, although he seems to have a lot of power, he's in fact a prisoner of a lot of the groups around him, and it seems to be increasingly that seems to be including Kadira. And so Russia, uh, rather than having a capacity to reform, is, is actually moving slowly into a dead end. And I think the longer that Putin stays in office, the greater the damage is to Russian society, which is something that, that Sakwa doesn't really talk about. He's really focused on the state. But the longer that Putin's there, the more damage you're going to have to civil society, and the, and the more difficult it's going to be to recover from that damage. And the, the second point I wanted to make was that the optimism that Sakwa expresses about the capacity for political reform in Russia really goes against the recent trend. And so if you look at the mayoral level across Russian cities, we see that there's been a long-term trend over many years now to get rid of direct mayoral elections and to put in uh, appointed city managers. And this is going on even though polls show that people really want to have those elections in place. And the second uh, point to make there is that if you look at the reforms that Medvedev implemented, which was restoring governor's elections in 2012, since then, every single election for every single governor has been won by the Kremlin's candidate even when regions where it's very clear that the local incumbent was not very popular. In some cases, they got rid of that guy and put somebody else there. But every single election, so it's more than 40 elections in the last three years. So that, that doesn't look like a, uh, an effort to open up the political space. And then the fin finally, just to make a smaller point, was that the claim that Putin is improving the business climate for small entrepreneurs is rather incredible that, uh, that you bring that up. And so this is something, of course, that Rush has been talking about for many years now but there hasn't really been much of an effort uh, uh, to, to make real progress on cutting regulations or cutting the amount of corruption. And in fact, you, you see signals to the opposite because in 2014, last year, Putin merged the arbitration courts into the courts of uh, general jurisdiction. And so the arbitration courts were the courts where businessmen go to settle commercial disputes or they can sue the, the state. And those courts were considered the most independent and the most uh, useful in Russia. And now, uh, they've basically been subordinated to the other courts that are much more under political control. So there's much less room for uh, uh, businesses to resolve their disputes independently. So let me stop there. That sort of gives you a, an overview of Sakwa's ideas and then a uh, few points of response. OK, thanks very much. Um, my sort of terms of reference were to consider whether or not Russia was more secure now than when Putin first came to office. Um, and 
the obvious answer to that, comparing the situation now with the end of the Yeltsin era, is of course, but then again, one has to say that is one of the lower bars to ever have to surmount. I mean, after all, the 1990s were a period of phenomenal um, international chaos and impotence for Russia, a domestic um, uncertainty, we'll, we'll be putting it politely. Um, and if we look at the situation now, I mean, clearly it would seem to be by any objective standard that actually Russia is stronger and more secure um, in terms of its, its, its security position than, than before. Its armed, armed forces have not been fully reformed, but are going through a process of reform. Um, one, can even, one can just simply look at the evident surprise um, at the, the quality of performance of the polite people, the little green men um, who were involved in the immediate uh, seizure of Crimea um, amongst a lot of Western analysts. Um, its intelligence services are highly active. Um, it has a, a massive and extensive domestic security apparatus. And the Russians are also in some ways ahead of the game in terms of how they're thinking about the future of security. Um, in terms of, for example, they're planning for cyber operations and how to integrate that with other more kinetic um, forms of security. Um, they're planning for what we could think of as political effects-based operations. In other words, where the military are just one small part of wider intelligence, economic, political operations. Um, most modern countries nowadays give lip service to that. But in practice, generals like to be generals. Um, and we still tend to have a notion of warfare which is really based on body count rather than outcomes. Well, in some ways, the Russians, at least in terms of their thinking, their, their, their conversations within the security apparatus, are beyond that. But, sure, you'll gap that I'm building up to a caveat or two or three or five. Um, actually, I think there are, firstly, some severe challenges. And in some ways, ironically, the very effort to create security structures has introduced a whole series of new insecurities that I want to come to. So let me just first just, just dip into the level you know, what progress has been made um, before unpacking some of the assessments about actually how far it has left Russia more secure. The armed forces are in the midst of a, a serious, sustained, and very well-funded uh, reform program that really um, has actually been in place since 2008, um, the war in Georgia, which brought to the fore the failures of reform up to that point. And in some ways it provided um, the defense minister at the time, Sergei Kov, and more to the point, his chief of general staff, General Makarov, um, the lever they needed to take a, a general staff, take an officer corps, which frankly was extremely conservative, so unlike other military apparatuses, of course, mm -hmm. um, really wanted to continue to fight the wars that people got used to it, wanting to fight. Um, and actually uh, making them appreciate that actually it was time for more dramatic change. And therefore we have seen everything from um, restructuring of the armed forces, I don't want to get into sort of excessive military wonkery, but you know, from divisions to more flexible brigade structures and such like, um, an attempt to increase the professionalism as well as the proportion of professionals um, within the military and so forth. And it has been successful up to a point. I would say that in some ways Russia now has two armies, not one. Um, it has units that actually have been through quite a sustained reform process. They are much more professional, in that they are much more well equipped with relatively modern equipment. Their officers have been through the training, they are relatively good officers, they understand that there is a need for initiative, which has always been one of the uh, Achilles heels of the, of the Russian military. Um, but these tend to be the, the, the relatively special intervention forces, the Spetsnaz commandos, the naval infantry marines, the paratroopers, certain elements of the ground forces, and the, the people who we saw in Crimea, and the people, to be honest, who we're seeing deployed in southeastern Ukraine. It's hard to really put a sharp number on it, but I would say maybe a third of, of, of certainly of the ground forces should be considered at this sort of advanced army, which is not, as it were, at the very, very top level of the, the most advanced NATO armies, but certainly is of the, to say, the European NATO average. But then again, there is a still relatively unreformed military. 
much more prone still to issues to do with indiscipline and hazing, very brutal culture of Yino Kishina. Um, still hasn't, I mean, even if they are formally shifted to a brigade structure, they haven't really sort of shaken out that structure and are, aren't really able to be operating well, certainly in terms of sort of interoperational capacities. Uh, but also because these units aren't so good, they tend to have a smaller proportion of professionals. Officers of any caliber try and get the hell out of these units and into the better ones. So you have a process in which there's an element of cannibalization of the quality. These people are fine for defensive operations, the sort of classic traditional things, but given that I don't really think that the Chinese are going to be rolling across the border any more quickly than NATO and roaring forth, whatever Kisilov may be saying, um, they are essentially domestic security forces as much as anything else. But still, there is a small, I mean, in some ways, let's face it, Russia needs a small army anyway. Um, Russia has the army it needs, it also has an army it doesn't need, it just hasn't quite got around to that. Um, and the, 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 sort of the new style of hybrid, non-linear operations or whatever, we have to realize that they're not a, they're not a magic solution. Um, Crimea was a, a unique situation. What's going on in southeastern Ukraine can hardly be regarded as a particularly comfortable situation for the, for the Russian military or the Kremlin to be in. What they thought was clearly going to be a short operation is not. But nonetheless, they are trying to think about how a small, and let's face it, relatively impoverished country, the Russian economy, how you measure it, I mean, somewhere between Italy and Brazil. And yet, it's basically trying to punch well above its weight, and in many ways doing so. It maintains nuclear arsenals, it has intervention forces, and so forth. So they're trying to think about how they can actually operate in a modern battlefield with the resources they've got. Their intelligence structures are phenomenally active. Um, Counterintelligence agencies across Europe and in North America <coughs> attest to the fact that basically Russian espionage is as active, as broad, and as aggressive as it was in the height of the Cold War. Um, many of these operations come up with very little of these useful information, but that is the nature of modern intelligence. Much of what the CIA does, much of what MI6 does, does not come up with useful information. That's just the nature of it. You go out there because you're looking for the odd nugget of gold that really makes all the difference. Um, it's easy to poke fun at some of the uh, activities of Russian intelligence that we saw in New York. Um, eavesdropping on the water cooler conversations of Russian spies, but then again, you can eavesdrop on any of our water cooler conversations and we probably don't come out sounding as if we're especially professional or smart. Um, the fact of the matter is that there, there is a lot of highly effective intelligence work going on. And domestic security, it may be a distinctly different model from the one we, we would adopt, but nonetheless, um, in terms of the assignments that said, it has done the job. Sochi, can, despite the threats from um, North Caucasus insurgents, um, carry out very smoothly. Terrorism continues to be an occasional problem, but actually is, to be honest, at a controlled level. Um, crime may be on the increase now, but on the whole, much of Russia is relatively well policed and relatively safe. So everything seems to be working out fine. No, as, I, as I warned, there, are, there were the old caveats. Um, the power of the intelligence agencies. Um, my concern has never been whether or not they're actually gathering good intelligence. My concern is whether or not that intelligence actually makes it to the decision-making process. Um, it seems increasingly clear it's not just about propaganda. The, the Kremlin does not understand the West. Now, one could say the West doesn't understand the Kremlin. I have a lot of sympathy for that perspective, but that's anyway an, another conversation. Um, and to a degree, I think what happens is because they are operating in a contested environment where they're all trying to get the Tsar's ear. My suspicion is that intelligence is becoming increasingly politicized in the sense that people are just providing the analysis that they know the Tsar wants to hear. So no, it doesn't matter how good your intelligence gathering is. It doesn't matter how smart your analysts are putting the pieces together. If, it, if none of it is coming into the small, rarefied circles in which policy is made, it does not matter. 
And if anything, it, it, it's counterproductive in the sense of the very aggressiveness of Russian intelligence operations helps crystallize the narrative that says the West, that Russia is essentially the West's enemy. You know, there are, it is worth noting, two narratives. There is the Russian narrative of the extent to which the West is trying to isolate and push back and control. There are also Western narratives about Russia. Domestic security, likewise, I mean, it, it, it operates on an essentially um, often quite clumsy, competitive, redundant, and sometimes under control form. I mean, it's interesting we have a lot of discussion about the role potentially of the intelligence services or security services in the murder of Boris Nimtsov. Now, who knows? We still do not know. I mean, we don't even know if the suspect who confessed and that was retracted his confession and, what, and whatever, quite what's going on. Um, my view is not, frankly, that this was something that was mandated in the Kremlin or even hinted at in the Kremlin. But on the other hand, we have a lot of quite compelling suggestions that this may well have been maverick elements within the security apparatus, possibly connected with Kadyrov, possibly competing with Kadyrov. The very fact that we have such discussions and people who are well informed are having these discussions tells us something about Russian domestic security structures. They are precisely, as much as anything else, competing viciously competing bureaucratic institutions which are willing to put their formal role, national security, public order, um, into a second place compared with actually their political struggles. We've seen this with the way, for example, there have been these naked power struggles over control of economic crime investigations, which was there really the honey pot, as well as being politically important and elsewhere. So I think that the point is that actually we see massive structures which are often counterproductive in how they actually play out on the ground. And one last example of that is the North Caucasus. The North Caucasus is, shall we say, under control. There is a constant litany of shootings and murders, but basically what happens in the North Caucasus stays in the North Caucasus, as far as the Kremlin is concerned. But the point is the very tactics that they use, often very brutal, very punitive and repressive ones, continue to generate the next generation of jihadists, of suicide bombers and so forth. There is no solution being provided. There is, at best, control. Um, the expense of all this apparatus is counterproductively crippling. And it's an open question how far a lot of the rearmament programs are actually driven by the desire of the military industrial complex to produce certain weapons and tanks and whatever else, rather than what actually the military and they themselves feel they need. But finally, and in this is the sort of the broadest point, um, I think. There is no way getting around the fact that Russia's current travails are particularly because of what's happened to the oil price. Okay. Um, but sanctions also have an impact. And more to the point, Russia does find itself increasingly in um, a confrontational stance with the West that ultimately Russia, in my opinion, cannot win. I'm not saying the West can win either, but this is not going to be good for Russia. No way around that. My question is, if Russia had not gone through its military modernization process. If Russia did not feel that it understood the West, even though it didn't, because of the scale of intelligence apparatus, would Putin have been as willing, as inclined, to launch the kind of aggressive operations which culminated in Crimea and southeastern Ukraine, as he did? In some ways, how far did this actually induce a confrontational approach in the Kremlin? And in this respect, actually, how far has ultimately Russia's biggest source of in sources of insecurity, its need to spend more than it can afford on the military, its increasingly um, confrontational stance with the outside world, the need to continue this uh, this sort of uh, apparently endless operation in southeastern Ukraine, how far were they generated by a belief that Russia was strong? Maybe if Russia had had useless troops and uh, you know, a half-hearted intelligence apparatus, it would never have been as aggressive to find itself in its current situation. <laughs>